Good afternoon. It's 345 Wednesday, September 4th. This is the TDN Writer's Room Podcast. I'm Joe Bianca, Associate Editor at the Thoroughbred Daily News. My name is Bill Finley, and I guarantee you I'm the only person who's ever worked for the Thoroughbred Daily News who has attended the races in Fargo, North Dakota. Brian DiNato, Racing Editor at the TDN. Jonathan Green, General Manager of DJ Stable and also a part of the Green Group, which is an accounting firm and tax consulting firm. So we already have something different from last week. We have a guest. It's John Green of DJ Stable, owner of A Thread of Blue, who's running in the Jockey Club Derby this Saturday. John, welcome to the TDN Writers Room Podcast. Thank you so much. It's very exciting to be here. So I guess we'll start with a basic kind of overview of how you and your family got into thoroughbred racing. Basically, it occurred about 30 years ago, if you can believe it, where we were uh, had an opportunity to go to Monmouth Park with one of our neighbors. Um, sure enough, the, uh, the neighbor owned a $5,000 claimer. The horse won. I got to win a you know, $5 win ticket on him. I was eight years old, so $20 in my pocket was a huge deal. Plus, I got a free hot dog, so you couldn't beat that day. Um, and we got to go to the winner's circle. And uh, the end result was we were driving home, and my dad said, did you have a good time? And I said, yeah, it was great. You know, what could be better than this? He said, yeah, and if our neighbor could win a race, imagine what we could do. And like I said, that was 30 years ago and 2,100 wins ago and 8,000 losses ago. But uh, we've always enjoyed you know, racing and competing here on the Jersey Shore. And you have, you have children, right? I do. I have two daughters, um, one of which is actually very involved in the, uh, the breeding game. She's been to Keeneland with me. She's been to the Saratoga sale and really enjoys that aspect. And the other one is not so uh, involved in racing, but she loves naming the horses. And we just actually named a horse after her uh, alma mater, Colby. Uh, after Colby College, um, okay. and Colby will be running in a stake race at Monmouth Park in a couple of weeks. It's Maine, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Instantly, we named another horse Maine as, as I well. That wasn't so, taken. I know. It's really. <laughs> I think it was the only state in the union that wasn't that wasn't accepted yet. So. All right. All right. So we'll get to the horse. We we'll get to the big horse first. The threat of blue. I feel like there was a little bit of a question about him going a mile and a three six a mile and three sixteenths, and he proved the doubters wrong. Now he's going a mile and a half. What was the decision making process in terms of whether or not to tackle that? You know, that's a great question. We go back and forth um, whenever we talk about a specific horse, especially at this level, because there are so many opportunities to run in big ticket races, especially this time of year. The opportunity to run him up at Saratoga in the Saratoga Derby was daunting. Um, as you mentioned, he hadn't really won going more than a mile and 16th. So to add on an extra furlong is, is a little daunting, especially for a front running horse. Kieran McLaughlin really did a phenomenal job getting air into the horse, training the horse, and between his training and Louis Size's, you know, expertise on on the front end, that's really what in, enabled the horse to uh, go to the front and never look back. And, and John, now if you look back at the situation, the purchase of the horse at Ocala for four hundred and thirty thousand dollars, even at that money, that's a, turned out to be a very good buy. Would be a Grade One winner, except that last race was in its inaugural running, so it was not a Grade One, but. Usually at that sale, people are not looking for mile and a half grass horses. Right. And this horse doesn't really have that much of a grass pedigree. I can't imagine you, your father, your family were thinking, hmm, we're going to spend $430,000 on this horse someday when a mile and three sixteenths grass race <laughs> at Saratoga. He must have turned out to be, yes, good, like you thought he would be, but not exactly the kind of horse you thought. Not exactly. You, you're, you know, your point is, is well taken, Bill. I think anytime you buy a horse, regardless of the amount, you're going to have a preconceived notion of where you think the horse is going to run. As we know, they're athletes and they're temperamental, and sometimes your best guess is not what they're willing to do. The very first race, we actually tried him on the dirt because we anticipated him being able to handle you know, the, the dirt race. And uh, I think he beat one horse in the ambulance, and that was it. So then at that point, we decided to try him on the turf because he does have a lot of European blood. The, uh, the mare in, enthused actually has produced four graded stake winners um, on, you know, in Europe. And because of that, we thought, okay, the turf may be uh, ultimately what he wants to do. And kind of the rest is history. But you're right. Anytime you, you spend that kind of money on a horse, you're hoping that he's going to go two turns on the dirt because that's where the big money is. But I think that's starting to change here, that the climate and the interest of turf racing here in the United States is starting to, to improve. In terms of stretching him out, has anything in his training or anything in his demeanor changed as he's gotten older and he's, as he's matured? You know, that's, a, that's another good question. I think Blue, personality-wise, has changed a little bit. Um, once he won the three races in a row, you could see his confidence build. 
and he started walking around the barn almost like King Kong. I mean, he, he really was ready to take on all comers at that point. And horses are like that. They get that kind of enjoyment and excitement about being the alpha. And that goes from thousands and thousands of years of, of genetic uh, you know, breeding. But he feels like he's the alpha now. And that's why we were so surprised when we sent him over to Penn National running the Penn Mile. And he didn't run as well. It took him almost two full weeks before he got his mojo back. Hmm. So now looking ahead to Saturday's race, uh, what do you make of the field and how do you like your chances? You know, we when we sat down with Kieran uh, about two weeks ago to decide if we were going to run the horse in the uh, in the third leg of, of this uh, turf trinity, there was the question of can he go this far? Can he go a mile and a half? And you really don't have a lot of basis to, to make that estimate. Um, normally you would think, okay, come from behind horses would lend themselves to be able to go that distance. But uh, an old trainer friend of mine, Joe Orsino, told me years ago, if you have a front-running horse and you can relax him on the lead, then the race really doesn't start until the, until the top of the stretch. And I think that's really what happened with the uh, Saratoga Derby, and we're hoping that's going to happen with, the, uh, with this Derby as well. And John, I couldn't agree more with Joe Orsino. I, I think the New York has the best riding colony in the country, but one thing that they do is when you get in these marathon turf races, they all lose their minds. I mean, everybody wants to go 53 and 4, 117. Right. Yep. And it looks in this race, um, even though the last time out, your fractions were not that slow at all, you're the only speed in the race, you draw the rail, you have a smart jockey in Luis, Sayas, even if you're not necessarily the prototypical mile and a half horse, can't you see yourself getting that kind of trip? And if so, I would think it would be pretty hard to run down. No question about it. We're hoping that the, the first, you know, four furlongs, six furlongs, they, they time in a sundial. We're hoping that he goes <laughs> really, really slow on the front end. And if you go, you know, horse by horse in this race, there are some great accomplished horses, especially as three-year-olds. Um, Current is, is certainly a, a legitimate horse. Digital Age, who we've run against a few times, is a legitimate horse. And even some of the European horses coming in have, you know, have made their bones in their respective racetracks. I think that every horse in the field, including us, you can make a case for and you can also question whether or not they're going to handle this. There's a couple of horses that you'd say they ran lifetime best, us included. Are we going to bounce? The European horses are coming in. They like to sit from way off it, and they run clockwise versus, uh, you know, we're used to running counterclockwise. I can't see, how, you know, that that's good for them coming here and, and trying to run the race in the complete opposite direction. It's kind of like if we tried to drive there, you know, there, there, there's got to be a little bit of a learning curve there. And then there, there's also a couple of horses in here that we've run against before. And quite frankly, we've got, we've earned the dream trip and they haven't. And one of these days the tables are turned. So I'm really looking forward to being in the race. And don't get me wrong, I wouldn't trade our position with anybody, but I think that there you can make a case for four or five horses in the race. John, you mentioned early on that everybody who goes to the sales, usually the first thing they think of is, we want a classic mile and eighth, mile and quarter dirt horse. You can take a look at Thread of Blue and you can probably make a case for one or two things. One, he just doesn't like the dirt. Or two, maybe when you did run him on the dirt, he hadn't developed into the horse that he is now. Now, if scenario two is correct, maybe perhaps this is someday a Whitney-type horse and where the money, even though these horses are so big for these turf races, but nonetheless, the money is normally bigger. If you're ever talking about developing a sire, you're, you're going to be so much better off if you win a grade one. It's just a long-winded way of asking, have you guys and Karen McLaughlin thought, you know, if not this year, maybe next year, someday we'll give them another try in the dirt? I would think so. I think what's going to happen eventually is we're going to run in some big race, some big turf race, and it's going to come off the turf. And at that point in time, we say, okay, we've shipped to Kalamazoo. We're here. They're still putting up the same amount of money. I love that track, by the I way. I know. It's you mentioned that favorite. before. I had a super factor there one time. I wouldn't yeah. doubt that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so there'll, there'll be an opportunity where we're going to, you know, the race will scratch down to a certain small number of horses. None of them are accomplished on the dirt. And at that point, we'll try it. I don't know if we're going to go out of our way to try him on the dirt unless he really shows that there's an opportunity there for us. And just to give you an example, you know, when we are picking out races, we're not only picking out races for this specific horse, but we currently have a number of horses in training and we almost take the mutual fund approach where we look at it and say, it doesn't matter if a threat of blue wins or jaywalk or proven strategies. We're not really as concerned about which one wins as long as somebody in the group wins and carries the rest of the crew. If we are fortunate enough, like a threat of blue won the million dollar race uh, a few weeks ago, we could then take one of our other horses, in this case, Diamond King, and try him, who's an accomplished dirt horse, and try him on the turf 
because we had almost to get a jail free card. We had enough money where, you know, it was going to pay for everybody and we could test and, and try somebody else out. The Diamond King turf experiment didn't work last week, but that's not to say that we wouldn't try it with blue, you know, down the road. Just wanted to broaden this out real quick and, and talk about the turf trinity, inaugural turf trinity. I talked to Jeff Bloom. How do you, what do you think about the turf trinity? He's like, I love it. So I'm sure you're going to have a similar response, but do you see it as something that has staying power in New York? I would really like to, to think so. I, I think that with the political situation right now where everyone is looking at the industry and trying to figure out what is the root cause of you know, horses breaking down, whether it's recently in California or as early back as the first, you know, few Breeders' Cups, where it seemed like every single Breeders' Cup day, there was a horse breaking down. And I think as an industry, we all want to get to the root of the problem, whether it's the track itself or medication, you know, the horses being inbred, whatever it is, we want to figure out what, what the issue is. One of the solutions, though, that I personally feel is out there is running horses on the turf. It's softer. It's better for their bones. And if they're training on the turf, it seems to lay bone down, you know, kind of like the way that Calumet does it and the way that Darby Dan used to do it, where they would constantly try their horses on the, on the or train their horses on the grass until they got to be a three-year-old, and then they would try them on the dirt. Mm. John, let's talk about Jay Walk. Uh, it is a bit probably... Uh, safe to say that she has not been as good this year as you would have hoped. She had that great comeback race at Delaware Park, and then everybody was, oh boy, the old jaywalk is back. Then she got beat, by, albeit by a good horse um, in Horologist, but then finished second in, in the uh, Mom, Mammoth Oaks. What is her status? Is she on uh, on the trail of the cotillion? And uh, has the uh, team figured out any reasons why maybe she has not necessarily looked like the jaywalk of last year? Yeah, and, and you know, we we've gone back and forth with John Service who trains her to try to figure out, you know, why Jaywalk hasn't gotten to the next level. And, you know, part of the, the problem is that a lot of other horses have caught up to her. When they when they win big races as a two year old, whether it's the Breeders Cup as a two year old or the hopeful you guys were talking about last week. Um, and why don't horses continue to develop? Well, it may be that just they develop to that extent, um, you know, early on. We really feel like for Jaywalk that even though it looks like on paper she hasn't gotten to the next level. She's still running consistent numbers that are good enough to win some of these grade twos and grade ones um, against other fillies. I put it on myself as the general manager that maybe we put her in a couple of races that we shouldn't have because they were tougher than 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 uh, than we anticipated. Um, but ultimately, she is on path to run into the cotillion, and then after the cotillion. It is a win and you're in. If she wins, we will send her to California. If not, then we have to kind of reassess what we're going to do with her. Worst case scenario, you still got that Eclipse statue on your shelf. So I, I understand they never take that. it away from yeah. you, which which is always a nice thing. It's actually sitting, uh, you know, I have a, uh, one of them that's sitting in my home office, and I know my dad has one in his home, in his uh, business office as well. And I think there's actually a spotlight on his, so, you yeah, know, which I can understand. Pretty exclusive club. It, it really is. And we felt very fortunate to be there and also to be there with our partner, you know, from, from Cassius King. Chuck Zachney has been just a phenomenal partner with us on uh, Diamond King and on Jaywalk and a couple of these babies. It's amazing, just to digress for a second, a lot of these partnerships seem to be fine until a horse gets really good. And then once a horse gets good, then everyone has an opinion about what to do, and, and, and that's where the problem is. If you have a you know partner on a $10,000 claimer, nobody really cares. Mm -hmm. Okay, the horse is going to run for 10 either at Monmouth or Delaware, and you punt. Yeah. Um, but he's been just been a phenomenal partner and, and a great friend to uh, enjoy the ride with. Uh, speaking of Jaywalk, you found her in book four of Keelan September, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I assume you're planning to go back there this weekend? Absolutely. We'll, we'll certainly attend Keeneland. It's been uh, historically a great sale for us um, as far as rate of return and as far as stakes winners and stakes performers. Um, as you mentioned, we found Jaywalk in book four. My understanding is that there were just as many grade one winners out of book four and five combined as there were in book one, two, and three combined over the past three years. So you can find good horses anywhere. How do you typically prepare for such a large sale? You know, we will go through all 4,600 pedigrees and immediately knock off any of the ones that either we haven't been lucky with in the past or we just don't feel like fits our program. And also from a price standpoint, there's a lot of horses that are going to sell that are going to sell for half a million dollars or more that, that's out of our price range and a few horses that don't make sense because they may be locally bred and Ohio bred or a Kalamazoo bred that will uh, th that aren't of don't, as much don't interest. Don't be knocking Kalamazoo. I'm telling <laughs> it's a really nice race. The, the, the funny thing about yes. it is we actually, 20 years ago, we actually had the Michigan bred horse of the year, a horse there named Oh. 
yeah. my papa. So yeah. I am very familiar with, I didn't catch any bets on him, yes. but I'm very familiar with the Michigan program. There so I don't go. mean to denigrate that. And, and, and I'm sure he won the Kalamazoo Derby, which landed that uh, trophy, trophy right, right next to your Eclipse Award for sure, Jay Rock on sure. your mantle at we'll, home. We'll, we'll go with that, right? What's, what's the Michigan Bread Awards night like? <laughs> Michigan, it's at a Denny's, and, uh, and, and it's usually bring your own. So... <laughs> Yeah, so I guess we're gonna we're gonna segue here to the past weekend's racing, a lot of big races. And John, if you want to stick around and chime in, we're love happy to. to have you. So I guess we'll start with the hopeful. We did a little thing on the hopeful last week, as you mentioned, John. Steve Asmussen, Steve Asmussen had a really good hand heading into it, and couldn't have worked out better. Ran one, two, three. Basin is the one that was the longest price of the three, and he ended up dominating both of his stable mates and the rest of the field. Looked like shoplifted. Ran on late, started to find his feet pretty much in the second half of the race. What stood out to you guys, and feel free anybody here, about the hopeful and the performance of Basin? Well, what stood out was the performance of the trainer. I, I mean, when's the last time we talked about somebody finishing one, two, three in a grade one stakes race and it wasn't Chad Brown? Chad Brown, right? Chad Brown, right. You know, Steve Asmussen deserves a tremendous amount of credit. Now, granted, these were the first three favorites in the race. Granted, Greenlight Go, who likely would have been the favorite, was scratched. But, you know, to win the first grade one of the year on the East Coast uh, and not only win it and finish one, two, three is a tremendous accomplishment. And we had talked last time on the podcast about the fact that basically if you win the hopeful, you can pretty much forget about winning the Kentucky Derby because it hasn't happened since 1978. But I got a sneaking suspicion that maybe things will change this year for a couple of reasons. First of all, these are three very good horses. And second of all, doesn't it feel to you guys that these great trainers like Steve Asmussen, they wait their turn, they wait their turn, they wait their turn, and eventually they get it. It comes to him. Steve Asmussen is, is, is not a particularly old guy. He's going to win a Kentucky Derby before his career is over. Maybe it's in 2020. Of the three, I like Basin the best. Why wouldn't you? He won and uh, looked pretty good. By Liam's map, no reason to think with that sire. He couldn't go a mile and a quarter. So maybe the uh, hopeful Kentucky Derby jinx will be broken next year. All you had to do was bring it up on the podcast. That's right. Yeah, there so you go. Right. Time's yeah. ticking for it now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, Bill, I agree with, with your sentiment about, uh, you know, what a phenomenal training job uh this was you know coming into the the, the hopeful um i think you're right also though that green lake go really was the horse uh to beat in that race you know we ran against him actually with another miracle and he you know another miracle is a five furlong turf horse who won the skidmore and is going to hopefully run in the breeders cup juvenile turf and he ran us off our feet and when was the last time you saw a hard spun out of a pleasantly perfect mare win and win impressively trained by jimmy jerkins trained by jimmy jerkins yeah. exactly it doesn't crank his horses up and, until later and again to go back to the medication is still not on lasix so there's a lot of upside i think on green light go um he's beaten some phenomenal horses already early on in the in the business the main story is look what a great job steve did with his first three uh you know finishers but very close second has got to be keep an eye on green like go and i'm not telling anybody anything that they don't know already but that horse really impressed me just as a, an outsider looking in and uh, speaking of turf sprinters i'd love to see gozilla in a turf sprint i think he has turf sprint written all over him the dam was a turf miler she's a half to i think two graded stakes winners on the grass and he's just one of those horses who seems a little too quick maybe to want to stretch out and he looked really good at obs april on the synthetic so I think he's probably a turf sprinter. I, I think you're right. I think if you look at his genetics, it, it says turf sprint uh, all over it. Gary Barber, incidentally, bought 25% of them right. before this race. And the rumor is that he bought it for a million dollars. So the horse was, was basically a $4 million valuation. I'm not sure they're going to go immediately to a five furlong sprint right. based on that valuation. I think he did it based on, hey, I want this horse to run in the, you know, in the classics or at least, you know, some of the opportunities uh, mm -hmm. that avail themselves in the next couple of weeks. But you're right. If you look genetically, that horse absolutely screams sprint turf. Well, let's switch coasts now and go look, take a look at what happened with the two-year-olds out at Del Mar. And uh, first I want to give it, Jim McInvale. This, of course, was the Run Happy Del Mar Futurity. Um, and I have a radio show I do with Dave Johnson on Sirius XM Radio every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 Eastern on Channel 156. And we had Mac on last week. He says, Mac, what's left to, 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 uh, to sponsor? You have you sponsored everything but the third race at Timonium today. He says, next year I'm sponsoring the toilet paper 
in the in the bathroom at Del Mar. <laughs> you know what? I wouldn't put it. You past think he's kidding? Them. No, okay. yeah, I wouldn't put it past them to do that. But it, you know, we had talked again about last week on the podcast that this race normally we learn more about the Kentucky Derby contenders, and by and large, that's simply because Bob of Bob Bafferty won the thing fourteen times, and with horses like American Pharaoh, and you can note that a Bob Baffert horse, if it's got talent as a two-year-old, has a darn good chance to become running in the Kentucky Derby. This race proved absolutely nothing. It was, it was an absolute mess. I mean, eight rings, the Baffert horse was one to two fell, and then a horse that, that just came out of a, a, a claiming race, albeit a $100,000 claiming race, uh, trained by the, uh, Peter Miller by the name of Nucky. I assume the, those of you who watch Boardwalk Empire uh, would realize it's probably named after Nucky Thompson, mm-hmm. the character on there. Great show, by the way. Wins the race, pays a zillion dollars. Peter Miller's one too. Um, did anybody think that that race shed any light on this year's two-year-old crop and how they may advance towards next year's Kentucky Derby? I mean, I was talking to Brian before. It was a strange race to watch visually. Um, obviously, the, the race was turned upside down a couple strides out of the gate when eight, eight rings took a left turn. Reminded me a lot of uh, Dre Fong a couple of years ago. Right. Um, did the same thing. I think he was the number two as well, big favorite. It was a fast pace, and Nucky made a pretty early move. A three-eighths pole went to the lead. They went 21 and change, 44 and change, and it seemed like they were really gasping for air late, but nobody closed. So I think that's that's part of the reason that you can't take too much from it is just it didn't seem like, other than the winner, anybody really picked up their feet. And it's the buyer says that. The buyer is 68, I believe, which is probably I the lowest. Know, wow, yeah, that's got to be among the lowest. Grade one winning. Yeah, that that, that, that doesn't. Think. That may not win a maiden thirty five. Sometimes. Yeah, so I mean, goodness. yeah, yeah. So that's. Um, I I think about old horses who run grade ones with slow figures. Sutra when she run mm-hmm. ran the won the Frisette, I believe yeah. she was like a sixty nine buyer or something along those lines. But yeah, so visually it it kind of told the tale that they were coming home slow, but nobody closed. Um, so I I, I would kind of draw a line through that race for everybody except maybe the winner. But how do you guys feel? Uh, well, first of all, I swear this is the last time I'll do that. That buyer number would not win the feature at Kalamazoo, would it, John? <laughs> no question about it. And, <laughs> no you know, you, you mentioned it wouldn't win a, a maiden race. There were two maidens in this race. Yeah. So, again, it, it, it may just be, what did he beat? Um, yeah. I think you're right. You can put a line through the majority of horses, not all of them, including the winner, um, and basically say, you know, he's going to have to prove it to me again. Yeah. I thought what Eight Rings did was actually pretty amazing. He was way, way out of it. You would have assumed he kind of just would have been pulled up or would have pulled himself up. And he managed to pass almost everybody in the stretch and galloped out well. I mean, it, he seemed like a superior horse going in. He probably is, obviously. It kind of looked like, uh, remember that race with Long Weekend and Dennis's Moment, the Romans yep. horse? Yeah, and, Long, yep. and, and Long Weekend opened up by 10 lengths. Right. Dennis's Moment lost the jockey and then ended up with him right on the wire. And then <laughs> so what Dennis's Moment did next time yep, out. So. Exactly. One thing I wanted to touch on before we moved on from last week's races was the Woodward, and I thought it was a pretty gutsy effort by preservationists and a kind of an interesting horse who took a long time to put things together. I think he might have run like five or six times in, in three seasons, and now he's put three races together. He was dominant in the Suburban, didn't run that great in the Whitney, but really bulled through traffic in the stretch to take the Woodward, and it kind of made me think about the older male dirt division, and Last year, at this point, we had Accelerate, who was well on his way to a championship. There really was nothing that anybody could do to be a fly in the ointment there. But this year, I mean, you look at the big races. The big cap was won by Gift Box, the Gold Cup, Vino Rosso, the Foster, Seeking the Soul. Preservationist now has two grade one wins. McKinsey won the Whitney in the Ali Sheba. Higher Power wins the Pacific Classic. To me, the clear leader in this division is a horse that might win another championship, and that's Matoli. He's got three grade one wins now on the year. Nobody else, as far as I know, in the older dirt male division has two. Does anybody have a problem with Matoli winning both of those awards? Yeah, I, I got a big problem with that. He's a, sp- <laughs> he's a sprinter. I, and look, and I'm old school. I believe that he has, the sprinters have their own category. Leave it to, to that. Yeah, I mean, you can't, it's not fair because if you give him the Eclipse Award for both sprint and root horse, well, McKinsey, he's not, he's not eligible for the sprint award. And, and I also think that as well as preservationists ran, and what a, you're right, what a gutsy effort. I mean, horse showed a tremendous amount of tenacity. Big winner in that race was McKinsey. I mean, so preservationist wins the Suburban, gets his doors blown off by McKinsey in the Whitney, and then comes back and wins the Woodward. I think that right now, you know, everybody's staying the way they are. With all due respect to Matoli, 
because I don't include them in this group, I include them in the sprint group, or maybe perhaps they go in the dirt mile. I don't know what their plans are, but I would think the sprint would be more likely. I, I just think it's McKinsey and everybody else. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he's going to go in the awesome again. He should win that. And uh, unless he lays an egg Breeders' Cup day, which I don't see, it's going to be hard to surpass that horse. I think it would have been a stronger argument for McKinsey if he hadn't lost to Matoli. Now, I understand he had trouble in the Met Mile, but they faced head-to-head, -head and, and, and Matoli beat him. So I think at the end of the year, that's going to hold a little bit of weight. I wanted to talk about freshman sires, you know, and, and it, there was a ton of hype going into this year's class. Obviously, the headliner was American Pharaoh, but there were a lot of horses that people were excited to see their foals, Honor Code, and Liam's Map, and such. I think some of them might have gotten off to a little bit of a slow start. Liam's Map didn't have that many winners, but then he had a pretty, uh, pretty seismic winner w with Basin. Do you guys think that this class has lived up to the hype so far, and what do you think about them going forward? Well, my first question would be, and I'm, I'm the last guy that should be answering that question because that, that's not my field of expertise. I want to hear what the uh, other three, but isn't it a little bit too early to tell? Um, can we really judge them uh, on September 2nd? Um, and the only thing I would add to that is that, at least from the numbers, American Pharaoh certainly seems to be living up to expectations, leading at least wins-wise. From the TDN website, I learned that he has 12 uh, winners right now, which puts him in the number one. So, and every, when I uh, was interviewing people before the year, everybody thought that the Pharaohs would not be early developers, that they would be more fall, you know, champagne, Breeders' Cup, juvenile type horses, not, you know, win first out at Saratoga the first week of the meet or win at Delmar the first week of the meet. So that would be my one comment. But again, I, I, um, I would like to pass the microphone to people that know a lot more about this than I do. Yeah. And, and just going through the sales, um, you know, as often as we do, you, you tend to gravitate towards certain freshman sires uh, based on the falls that you see. And, uh, you know, sometimes it, it, it's real hit or miss. But I know going through this crop of, of two-year-olds, um, Liam's map was the one that continually was ringing the bell at sales. Um, and it almost didn't matter what sale it was. If there was a Liam's map, people were immediately jumping on top of it and, and trying to buy it. You know, I concur, Bill, with, with your comment about American Pharaoh. It's not just because we own one. We own one that, that's running well. But who would have thought that he would have thrown two-year-old runners and early two-year-old runners, precocious runners, and mostly on the turf. You know, so again, you go back to the argument of can we, you know, can we anticipate based on uh, genetics and, and based on crosses, and you almost have to just try them out. But American Pharaoh has certainly hit the ground running. Liam's map looks like he's going to start to develop some good horses. Constitution and Honor Code were the other two of the, of the top four horses that, at least from a yearling's sales price standpoint, rounded out the group. And I think all four of them are going to represent. It's just a question of, hey, it's only Labor Day. Let's wait and see you know, how things play out over the next three or four months before we uh, send in the verdict. Constitution is an interesting one because, like, like you say, there was a little bit of buzz about him, but he stands for 15,000, or at least did in his first season. Tied for the top, I believe, right now in overall winners. He's got 12. He's got three stakes winners, I believe. He's got three TDN Rising Stars, the most import important metric of all. Um, <laughs> Boy, so now talk about shameless plugs, plugs there, right. by the way. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he, his, his horses have been really, I think, jumping out a lot, especially at Saratoga. And it's going to be interesting to see if, if he keeps that up because he was, I guess, was a little bit of a late developing three year old. And, you know, he did his best work in the summer. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's, really stepped, he's really stood out to me. And no question about it. And also, Constitution, out of those top four, he has the least number of prospects that are out there, of overall foals, I should say, that are out there even. Honor Code by far had the most American Pharaoh, Liam's Map, and then Constitution in that order. So you would think that just based on crop size um, that some of these other horses would kind of rise to the top. That's why it's been amazing to watch Constitution do what he's done. Mm -hmm. Other, another one I wanted to shout out uh, who hasn't gotten that much buzz is Tapature. Tapature horses have been pretty mm -hmm. good first out. I think he's got 11 or 12 winners, so he's, he's one that – and in the same vein as Cross Traffic, who might not have had so much hype going in, that by the end of his first crops, first racing year, people, everybody knew about him. Everyone knew about him, and now he might be headed to Turkey. So <laughs> that, that, if, that, if that's not the rubber stamp of what the next great sire is going to be, it's, you know, send him on a boat to Turkey or Korea, and all of a sudden they start having huge runners again. Well, it's up to you to carry the flag with Jaywalk. So. <laughs> I think another one to keep an eye on going forward might be Wicked Strong. He did pretty well at the two-year-old sales, and... He wasn't a particularly early developing horse. I think he maybe debuted maybe September of his two-year-old year and was more of a three-year-old. So I would 
expect to see some wicked strongs running well in the coming weeks. Yeah, other one I wanted to bring up was was Tonalist. Mm-hmm. Tonalist might have might have gotten off to a little bit of a slow start, but all those horses, most of those horses are running in five, five and a half, six right. furlong races. You would expect him with his his, his long winded racing record, and obviously fa- most famous for winning the Belmont. You would, I think, you would expect him as the horses get to go two turns, they, they they'll pick it up. Mm-hmm. Bill, you did a story with Dave O'Rourke of the New York Racing Association. $700 million plus handle this year for Naira at Saratoga with the new schedule. What were your impressions from what Dave told you? Well, it's not my impressions mainly came from the numbers that were put out at the end. I I remember before the meet, I asked David O'Rourke, what do you expect uh, is going to happen with the new format, the eight weeks, five days. He goes, I can't, I'm not going to answer that question until closing day. So on closing day, I called him and said, Dave, what did you think? And of course, the, again, the numbers speak for themselves. It was, they hit it out of the park at this meet. Now, you take those numbers, it's, it's they said an all-time record handle number. They were up, um, uh, I believe, 7% over last year on all sources handle. And Way back when, which now seems like like seven years ago on Haskell Day, when it was so hot they had to cancel, that cost them, uh, I asked him in, about $21 million in handle as well. So the, the eight-week, five-day format worked magnificently, and it, there's no doubt that it's here to stay. The one thing our work told me that I thought was kind of interesting, though, was that they're going to put some thought into changing the dark days. Now, instead of having Mondays and Tuesdays dark, he thought they might. there's a chance that they go to Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And he said one of the reasons why is because the um, Saratoga, the town, you know, the nightlife, the, the restaurants, the hotels, the bars, et cetera, he said were, was completely dead on Sunday nights this year because there was no reason to stick around after the last race on Sunday. Everybody was going home. He said, uh, you know, some of the business owners came to him and said, would you rethink this? He said, yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll take a look at it. And, he, you know, I, I, I asked him, you know, well, why wouldn't you just do what's best for Saratoga, the racetrack? And I really liked the answer he gave me. He says, because this is about much more than just the racetrack. Saratoga works because of the entire community and the entire Saratoga experience. He said, if, if the restaurants are dead on Sunday night, that's not good for Saratoga, the town, and what's not good for Saratoga, the town, is not is not good for the New York Racing Association. So that was a really good answer. Um, it was his his first time up there running the show um, after he got promoted. You know, everything everything went right. You know that you're always going to have a few problems. It was tragic and, and kind of bitterly ironic. The very last race in the meet, a horse broke down and had to be put down, which was geez, you know, you get that far and then it happens in the last race. The weather was was reasonably good. Um, I didn't get the final amount of off the turf races, but um, it was fewer than last year. They found a formula. It's here to stay. But one thing, another thing, um, and maybe John, John, did you spend much time at Saratoga as a fan this year? Yeah, I was there okay, actually I, twice. Okay, I want to get then I want to get you into this conversation one thing that was that was amazing was that the on track numbers I didn't get the attendance numbers but the on track handle numbers were actually down this year just just by a smidgen but um, did you uh, notice anything or or do you have any theories why the on track handle can be down yet the all sources handle you know set records it really looked like that. Uh, it, again, this is a, a layperson's uh, analysis on on a very small, you know, sample of, of days there. Anecdotally, I would say that there were just as many people there who were set up to, to watch the breeze shows at seven in the morning. Um, they were there at ten o'clock in the morning, claiming their their picnic tables. And it seemed like that the you know if you had a family reunion or or college buddies got together for Saratoga, all those groups continually came in and and consistently came in. Um, I think that a lot of people were betting on races, and then for a few days um, during the meet, there were very small fields. And you guys talked last week about 
um, the advantage or, or, or one of the benefits of a Kentucky Downs where they have 12, 15 horses in a race, and that's a handicapper's paradise. And I think that for a, a, a smidgen, just for a few uh, racing days at Saratoga, where whether it was because of the weather or, or, or scratches because of the heat or where horses just got sick, but there were you know four, five, six days within a two-week period where most of the average uh, races had six or seven horses in it, um, if not less. And it's tough to handicap and bet and want to bet on that, on those kind of fields, um, you know, when they come up that way. That's the only thing I can come up with, though. I just wanted to ask a follow-up on that. How much do you bet? How much do you handicap? Like, how, how big of a part is that of your track experience is that? You know, for, for me, the, the bet is when you write the check and you buy the horse because yeah, you're right. never going to make up that that, right. that that money. That being said, I do enjoy occasionally betting on a horse, especially if, if I feel like, hey, this is a first-time starter of ours that we feel like is, is going to do well, or we know that there were a couple of excuses as to why a horse didn't run well, or also we ran in a really tough race and that's a, that's a key race for for other horses and they're going on and running in other races and we feel like that there's an opportunity there interestingly enough last year the uh, there was a letter that came out from dennis drazen who who you know is director at monmouth park prohibiting us as licensed owners from betting of any kind at monmouth park so this summer we were allowed to go and root for our horses and, and certainly buy you know a hot dog if we wanted to but we were forbidden from betting and we, there would be sanctions of, of possibly losing your license as an owner if you wanted to bet so I'm not a good person to ask about Monmouth Park, but when I go to parks or I go to Kentucky Downs or Saratoga, if there's an opportunity, I'll certainly, you know, throw a couple dollars on a horse. On the Drazen thing, A, do you know what precipitated that? And B, if so, can you tell us? I, I, I'm i going to plead the fifth on that. Okay, that's what and I figured. Can't you send your Aunt Esther to the window and a bet for you? You, you probably could. You probably could get a surrogate to, to do it, you know, if, if you wanted to or get a runner. But for me, it's just not worth right. yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> no, not knowing the answer, it sounds like some it, – it's such a dumb idea. And Dennis is such a smart, smart guy, guy yeah. and such a good racetrack operator. It had to come from the Racing Commission. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't know that for a fact, but I, I would bet um, – bet my last dollar that was something completely idiotic that came out of the po- politicians yeah dennis drazen right. is gonna be the kind of guy that'll tell people no. not to bet yeah, yeah exactly right. yeah, it, yeah. dennis is way too smart to, to right. do something like that yeah we, so we talked about the handle increase at saratoga and the record handle not so much for delmar delmar had a down meet in terms of handle and attendance but one thing they did have going for them was no racing fatalities and I think at this moment, that's kind of an important thing, an important headline to get out there for the sport. And I, just being at Saratoga this year, there were a lot of anti-racing protesters when you walked into the gate. And that was not, that was something I personally had never seen before. So even though Saratoga and New York has a pretty good safety record, they're, they're, they're kind of focusing on, on all of racing at this point. And I think it's kind of big for Del Mar to have that kind of flag to put in the ground. And they've been doing this for a while. The safety record has been getting better and better at Del Mar. They, they've been instating new safety protocols. John, as an owner, how big do you think that this is to have a big boutique meet like this report no racing fatalities? Oh, no question. It's huge. I mean, just from, from an outsider on the East Coast, we're keeping tabs on that. You know, we're fortunate enough where we have four different horses running in win and you're in races over the next four weeks. If there was a concern about safety, they would not be getting on a plane and heading to California, even if they won, because ultimately you want to preserve and protect, you know, your athletes. That being said, the fact that there's uh, there was a quote unquote, a clean bill of health at, at Del Mar certainly makes me feel better. I would love to see the additional safety changes that are being implemented at Santa Anita. We're hearing rumors and speculation, but it looks like that for the most part, they're putting their money where their mouth is and they're, and they're uh, taking care of that racetrack. I, I'm sure Del Mar would have loved to have had better handle numbers, but I'm sure if you ask the people that run that place, if you had two choices, you could have zero fatalities and be down X percent in handle or be up Y percent in handle and have have seven or eight horses break down, they would have chose the the uh, um, the first part in a heartbeat. This was a huge win, not only for Del Mar, but more so for all of Southern California racing. And I think what it did m- more so than anything else is it took the heat off of Santa Anita because, you know, it, Del Mar was not the poster child for all the everything that's wrong with horse racing to the animal rights community. Santa Anita was. 
And now, if they had had a bad meet at Del Mar, then they could have lumped that in with Santa Anita. It would have stirred up all the crap all over again, and then the protesters would have been lined up, you know, 50 deep around Del Mar. It allowed everybody to take a deep breath. And when Santa Anita reopens in a couple weeks, you know, there's going to there's been an element now where people tend to forget things over time. And let's just hope that their meat is as safe as Del Mar's was. But I think that Del Mar having the, the safety factor going for it, there were what was what uh, I know there was the accident where two horses mm -hmm. collided with one another. And I believe one I horse. There were four total. There were four total, but yeah. none, none during racing, right. Right. which is absolutely huge. Huge. I think that that was one of the best good news stories we've had in horse racing this year. I wanted to bring Brian in on this, too, because you're a racehorse owner, too, and you manage a partnership, I think, with people buying in um, at, a, at a lesser fee. Do you have more casual fans that you kind of try to attract into that? And if so... Do they mention this to you? Do they mention the, the racing fatality kind of rash that we had at Santa Absolutely. Anita? Absolutely. I've gotten a lot of questions about that, and we have a few owners out in California, and I've talked to them about it, and they were kind of at first interested in maybe me trying to put something together out there, and then they kind of quieted down, and we're happy to focus on other jurisdictions. Uh, it's definitely a question I feel frequently among our co-owners. And what do you say? What do you say to people when they ask you about it? I mean, I'm as straightforward as I can. Obviously, we're all in this for the best interest of the horse, and I think getting that other perspective and seeing how, how we are with the horses and how we view our horses, I think they kind of see that you know, it's not maybe what it's always, what it's made out to be in the media. I think like a, a, bi a big bit of pushback towards the, the racing's negative image right now is the counter protesters, is, right. is the people that work in racing and the backstretch workers who show up. And they, I think that's key is that pe pe people who are closest to the horse, if they can show casual fans and, and, and laymen that they, that, they're about the horse right. in general. Like that, that's that's their daily life. They don't do this for the money. It it really resonates if you have someone that's on the ground, a bunch of people who are on the ground who can tell you about how much the horse means to them. I think that's big. All right, so that's all we got for you today. I want to thank Brian D. Donato, Bill Finley, and especially John Green, our first guest on the TN Writers Room podcast. Great job. Uh, this is Joe Bianca signing off for the TN Writers Room. We'll see you next week.